Hey there, welcome back to Little Guys, the show about little computers that are trying their best. And today is a very special episode because it's a twofer. Well, it's pretty obviously a threefer, but it, it's only supposed to be a twofer. This one's just here because it, it's a supporting character. You'll find out, it plays a role. It's not even really a little guy, it's just, uh, yeah. Yeah, this one's more normal than I wish it was. But these two, these have things going on. And you're not going to find out about this one anytime soon either because <laughs> the episode's actually about this one. But I needed both of those other two to get this one working. At least I hope. I don't even know if this is going to work. So this gadget is something that I think I got pointed to on eBay. I can't remember who, who sent it my way, but uh, I think somebody just told me like, hey, these things look interesting. Maybe you should check one out. And it wasn't very expensive, so I picked it up. And... Yeah, the outside of it doesn't tell us a whole lot. It's definitely some sort of uh, appliance, something, well, presumably a media appliance because it's called a media site, but it's made by somebody called Sonic Foundry, who I've never heard of. And what do we have? Well, it's a powder-coated steel chassis, probably semi-custom, but it's got a very simplistic design, just um, flat metal, no complex stampings. So uh, I'm gonna say they uh, they didn't shell out the big bucks on this one. And the only detail we have on the front is the vandal-proof power switch, which always looks cool, and is also one of the most readily available panel mount buttons that has a light in it. Around on the back, we got a port layout here that makes it obvious that it's it's a PC of some stripe. And honestly, uh, it's possible the motherboard in here is just like mini ITX, I'm not sure. Sometimes it's the case that companies that make stuff like this, where they want it to be uh, shorter than like any conventionally available PC case, they'll skip the standard removable IO bracket, even if they're using a, a, a ITX or ATX motherboard, uh, and they'll go with something like this. And that also gives them the option to hide ports that they don't want anybody to see. So I wouldn't be surprised when we open this up if we find out that there's two network interfaces here and they've just uh, obscured one of them. This is an incredibly common practice that this sort of custom steel chassis makes possible. You can tell that they're probably doing this because if you look in there, there's a bit of a gap between the plug and the back panel, and there's not really any reason not to make that flush uh, unless you're just trying to hide parts of the board. Like I said, this is really, really common. I see it all over the place. You open up little boxes like this, you find uh, mummified USB ports, serial ports, video ports, HDMI, network, you name it. Uh, so often they'll end up having more functionality than they actually appear to from the outside. Uh, by the way, I have had this open. I just have the brain of a goldfish, so I can't remember what was in there. But unlike most of the other machines in this series to date, this one has a fan. It's not meant to be a quiet machine, it's just meant to be an appliance. And that's a kind of a different category than the things we've seen before. They're gadgets that are supposed to be unnoticed, right? Their, their primary function is to just sit and run indefinitely uh, just as a component of something. But an appliance is more commonly an interactive thing, something you actually lay hands on and use directly, but they usually make some amount of effort to obscure the fact that it's just an off-the-shelf PC or, or that it's using PC hardware, hence hiding any ports that they think you would get confused by. Now, the more interesting thing back here are the inputs. This has a pair of DVI connectors that are labeled input and then say HDMI, DVI, RGB YPBPR. So obviously these are inputs to a video capture card. And if they didn't have the labels, then I might think that it was a, a you know completely ordinary one, right? That was just set up for, I don't know, like conference room type stuff where you want to take the output from a laptop and you know stream it or record it or overlay something on it, that sort of thing. But the fact that it says RGB instead of VGA and that it mentions component video makes me think that this is actually uh, something intended for possibly capturing you know television signals. And that makes it a lot more interesting to me. Uh, it's why I bought it and Unfortunately, it arrived dead. So we're gonna open it up, we're gonna take a look at what's in there, and then uh, we're gonna see if we can't fix it. Oh, you know what? <laughs> I forgot. We should look this thing up first to figure out what it was sold to do. Okay, so uh, whoever Sonic Foundry were, they apparently sold off the media site business to somebody called Ng House Systems. Okay, and they were a trusted leader in developing comprehensive video recording and streaming solutions for corporations, healthcare organizations, and government entities. So we could pretty much bet that this is more or less what I was thinking it was, some kind of uh, conferencing system. 
Now that didn't pull up anything about this particular product. Apparently uh, Media Site is the name of an entire division, or it was. Uh, here we go though, we've got a model down here. Oh, it's always good when you search for something and the only results are the thing being sold by people who don't know what it is on just like auction websites and whatnot. Uh, here we go, this looks like a pamphlet. Automated video capture for AV light spaces. Huh. Ideal for technology, light, teaching, and learning spaces. Uh, this makes day-to-day -day video and content capture possible for any room on campus or in the office. Oh, so it's not a streaming box. It's a capture box. Okay, so uh, let me clarify that a little bit. There's an entire cottage industry of things that look pretty much like this. And their sole purpose is to do video streams for people who don't know how to set up video streaming software. Like, you know, I don't need to go into this too much, I'm sure. It, it suffice to say that like OBS, vMix, that sort of thing may seem very straightforward to nerds. <laughs> Anybody watching this channel could probably figure them out, but there are an awful lot of people who either don't know any of the fundamentals uh, or just don't have the time to figure them out. They need to go in, press a button and be broadcasting. And that all needs to be set up ahead of time. Just push button, go. And so there's all kinds of products out there for this. And there have been for, at this point, I think well over 20 years. But this thing isn't actually for that. This is just a video recorder. So it says a uh, high quality dual stream capture. Record and synchronize video with content from screencasts, whiteboards, lightboards, visualizers, and more. Adaptive bitrate streaming. So there is some kind of streaming component. You can pre-schedule start and stop recording times or import them from scheduling or course management systems. So you can basically have it start recording when a class is supposed to start. That that seems error prone, but okay. Uh, here we go. And it looks like there would have been some sort of uh, like touchscreen based control software associated with this. I was wondering, you know, how this being just like a box, uh, <laughs> how this would be interacted with. And it sounds like, yeah, they had like a web interface for it and they had touch screens and whatnot. And then apparently when it's all done, there would have been a web editing platform where you could do video editing and publishing. Okay, it sounds to me, just inferring here, that this thing would be used to record you know, some kind of presentation. And then when you're done, it materializes in probably some cloud platform. And then you can go in there and edit it and whatever, and then push it to YouTube or uh, send links directly to students who couldn't attend, you know, that sort of thing. That's actually quite a product now that I think about it. Uh, there's probably a lot of things like this out there nowadays, but I wonder if this one has some years on it. It kind of has the feeling of being uh, maybe a little bit ahead of its time. Yeah, the copyright on this is 2020, so maybe it was developed, you know, post-pandemic, or maybe it was just updated, you know, in response to the pandemic uh, as they anticipated a uh, increase in demand. I don't know. Anyway, let's just look at the gadget itself. So this is the condition in which I received it, except for the dead sticker, which I put on there because I had taken this thing apart three times because uh, I kept forgetting that it didn't work. But otherwise, it came to me like this. Uh, so no hard drive. I don't have the software. Sadly, the software seems like a pretty big part of it, but I also think that the cloud software uh, would have been a pretty big part, and there's certainly we can't get that. Uh, naturally, we've got what else is new, the Windows embedded sticker here. I don't think that I found a single little guy uh, in all my years that didn't have a Windows embedded sticker on it. And then, yeah, there's really not a lot else going on in here, uh, frankly. This is coming back to me now. This thing is pretty damn bare bones, except for a couple odd things. So first off, the power switch and light leads come in and go through some loom. Like, I don't really know why they bothered with that. It doesn't seem like it would have been necessary in such a simple device. Uh, but they go into this board here, and I'll pull that board out and we'll take a look at it later. But then we just have a power cable for a SATA hard drive, which uh, would have mounted over here. Uh, data cable for same. Uh, this here, I think, is the uh, the connection to the, the front panel power switch. We have a fan here. We've got uh, forced air uh, cooling on the CPU in there. I'll pull that out and show you what that is. Uh, and then over here, we've got a serial cable. So we've got a, a serial port on the outside of the machine. And that's it, other than... Well, the star of the show, really, which are these two cables, which go back to capture cards. And those capture cards are really why I'm bothering with any of this, because it turns out the machine is actually super banal, and I don't have the software for it, and I never will. But the capture cards themselves, they're pretty neat. 
Video capture cards have been available in every single interface in the history of personal computing. Uh, they go back to the ISA slot in like early IBM PCs. I have parallel port video capture cards. Uh, you can get them for the Apple II and Commodore 64. You can get them for CPM machines, I believe, though I don't know what you do with them. Capture cards have been a fixture of personal computing since it was invented, but I've never seen one in a, uh, a mini PCI Express form factor. And this has two of them. So there it is, and that's all there is to it. And I mean, this is not <laughs> a feat of miniaturization or anything. It's just that I'd never seen it done. By the way, I don't know if it's Avermedia or Avermedia or what. I looked it up at some point, but I can never keep it in my head. Oh, that connector does not really want to come off. I'm just going to put it back on. And I believe you can just make out the model number right there. I believe that's it, the C353. I forgot, there's actually a, a brand name for this specific card. This is the Dark Crystal. So this guy is a full HD video capture card that has built-in H.264 hardware compression, uh, so that allows it to uh, run on pretty much anything. Uh, I think this machine actually has a decent CPU in it, but uh, it sounds like it wouldn't have actually needed it. And it can capture HDMI, VGA, or DVI sources uh, at up to 60 megabits, which is not half bad. Uh, I upload my 4K60 YouTube videos in like 70 megabits, so yeah, at, at 1080, I think 30 FPS, that's probably overkill. But yeah, other than that, like, that's pretty much all there is to it. It is a capture card in a mini PCIe format. You can just download the drivers from their website and install them. There's really nothing to it. Uh, so that's exactly what I did. When I found out that this machine was dead, I decided I wanted to see if the cards worked or if I should just throw the whole thing in the trash. Uh, so I pulled out this one, uh, which as you can see is in a carrier that adapts it to a uh, normal PCI Express because uh, this machine only had space for one mini PCIe card, uh, which is kind of interesting, right? Because, well, maybe you don't know this, but you could absolutely get industrial motherboards that have two mini PCIe slots. That's not hard. And uh, in fact, this one has two of them, uh, but I think I concluded that this was either M SATA or uh, that it's the um, the short version of the slot, so you can't actually put a full-size card in there. Something was wrong with it anyway. At any rate, uh, they clearly saw it as infeasible, so they went with this little uh, riser card. So I pulled this thing out and I just put it in another machine and tested it there. That was this machine, and the only reason it's appearing in this episode at all is just that I want to mock it, because it's not very good. Please prepare yourself for the most boring computer. This thing is absolutely dull. There's there's nothing interesting going on with it. It's definitely intended for, uh, you know, industrial applications. Uh, it's got a bunch of extra COM ports down here. Um, it's got the MSATA card on there. Uh, it's got a couple external COM ports as well and a dual built-in ethernet and it runs off of uh, straight DC. By the way, uh, this hasn't come up in the series so far. So these plugs right here, wonderful. They should be mandated by law in all countries. You should not be allowed to have a DC plug that doesn't have this on it. That's a screw collar. So it's just a normal like 5.5 by 2.1 DC plug, but you push it in there and then you screw it down. And in addition to strain relieving it, uh, it will not come out, right? It's a very simple idea. These have been available for decades. It, it just makes me so angry that we don't see them more. Uh, now, the cool thing is virtually every time that you see one of these, it takes 12 volts. It's just like a rule. I've seen dozens of devices that used these and every single one just took 12 volts. Yeah, there we go. 12 volts at five amps. What's this guy? 12 volts, five amps. Well, that's your boy. You may have recalled that I've mentioned FSP group before. Uh, preeminent manufacturers of 12 volt power supplies. I swear they make more than anybody else. I'm going to fire this up just for kicks because I already have the software on it and I got to retrieve it anyway. Oh, I have one more comment about this machine. Uh, another reason I don't like it very much. Uh, the uh, manufacturer of this thing, minimal though it is, actually bothered to do the thing everybody should do. They siliconed the front panel connectors in and I really don't want to rip it off because I'm probably going to tear off some surface mount components and just trash the thing. And I really don't like this chassis. So, uh, yeah, this computer sucks. I think that's an atom, something like that. Let's see. I don't want to come off as mean-spirited at all, right? Like, generally speaking, the theme of this series is that little computers 
are kind of wonderful just because they exist. PCs are so often big hulking sand kicking bullies, right? So when you see one that's just sort of a little and, and standing off in the corner, out of the way, just trying to be helpful and not get noticed, you can't help but uh, feel some affection for it, right? The problem I have with this one is basically just that it, it, it reeks of a kind of cheapness that the other ones don't. I don't like that this thing is not actually fit to its chassis, and I don't know why it isn't, right? Like, take a look at that. There's no other mounting holes in there. You couldn't have put anything in there to fill any of that space. So someone custom manufactured this chassis to fit a board of that exact size and then just left a whole bunch of empty space in there. I have no idea why, and it irritates me. Why did they do this? And it's built really, really poorly. Like this is just <laughs> the lightest weight computer. And then after all that, it's not even a full height case, so you can only put half height PCIe cards in it. I mean, come on. If you're gonna have the machine be this big, make it an inch taller so you can use a normal card and uh, just, you know, put a micro ATX board in there instead of mini ITX, it'll be a lot more, you know, useful, right? And on top of that, they put this massive uh, passive cooling heat sink on there and then they have to use a fan to exhaust it, right? Like someone screwed up. This thing does not look like it was fit to any particular purpose. And I mean, none of that really matters or holds water, but come on, it's, it's funny to get mad at things for bad reasons. Okay, and as I suspected, this is an Atom D2550, uh, which means that that uh, CPU is soldered on. You can't upgrade it to anything better. It does have eight gigs of memory, at least. But as much as that other machine sucked, I was able to test the cards in it and they worked perfectly. So at that point, I wanted to get the machine working. But as I said, I took it apart uh, three or four times and, and I couldn't figure out what was wrong with it. It just plain doesn't work. Now, my first thought was that maybe it wasn't actually getting power because the power inlet is a bit unusual. Uh, it's this plug right here, and just about anyone who's held an office job will recognize that as the uh, very similar uh, Dell or HP 19 volt center pin plug uh, that's used for uh, pretty much all their laptops going back a very long time at this point. This is a uh, 19 and a half volt supply that provides 6.5 amps. Now, uh, this one is actually silk screened with its current rating, which as I've mentioned before, is so rare with these things, 7.89 amps. So this does not provide enough juice to run this thing at full bore. But the other thing you have to remember is that uh, this was probably made with some question in mind as to what kind of uh, hard drive, what kind of CPU is gonna be in it. So that's a conservative estimate. You certainly don't need eight amps just to turn the damn thing on. Yes, I am this bad at math. That is 156 watts. Yeah, you don't need 156 watts to just start up a computer, but let's, let's just make sure it hasn't resurrected itself. These are colloquially known as Mickey Mouse cords. Can you guess why? All right, so it's on, but that's it. That's as far as we get. The, uh, the machine is getting power. This fan is spinning. That fan is spinning. I've pulled the CPU and made sure there's no, um, you know, there's no damage to it. There's, uh, there's no messed up pins on the LGA, nothing like that. I'm sorry, the fans just slowed down. Did it boot? Did this boot? I will scream. I will scream. This would be easily the sixth time I've sat down with this damn thing. If it is suddenly working, I'm gonna have somebody build me a drywall wall so I can punch it. There's no way, right? There's no way. I can't exactly remember if it's never done this before, but I don't think it's ever done this before. Okay. All right. <sighs> Just for uh, for kicks, let's uh, check the display port. Nothing doing there either, at least if it speaks HDMI. Okay, I've tested thoroughly and it is definitely not powering up, or at least it's not emitting any video. And I've already tried replacing the RAM. I've reseated the CPU. I think I tried replacing the CPU. I've taken out every unnecessary part. Uh, I've tried a different power source, I think. I've cleared the CMOS, I've done absolutely everything, nothing will get this working. So it really appears to just be a dead motherboard. This, of course, would not be the least bit shocking. Usually people throw things away when they don't work anymore. Okay, that's a damn lie, but you know what I mean. It's not surprising when you get something used and it doesn't work. So let's just go ahead and get this motherboard out of here. I forgot to mention, by the way, uh, the way that this card mounts is very funny. It plugs into the mini PCI slot here, and then this little bracket just lands on the screw that goes to the corner of the motherboard, and that's it. That's all that holds it in. It's only tacked down at one edge. 
I mean, whatever works, I suppose. It's not like this thing was expecting to be in a high vibration environment. All right, does that get the board out? No, I think that these go through into uh, inserts in the, uh, the steel base plate. So there's our CPU, and, and by the way, it's a, a pretty nice heat sink. Very short fins, so it's a good thing they went with copper. Uh, but man, that's, that's quite a bit of copper. Does that make it come out? Yes, it does. There's actually like a little insulating fish paper in here. Like, hmm, I, I don't think that I've really seen that very often. It's not a bad idea. It just shouldn't be necessary. So this board, as it turns out, is actually a completely ordinary off-the-shelf Intel desktop board. It is a uh, DQ77KB. I expected this to be some sort of uh, special industrial board, and I mean it is, it's just not one from some, you know, random company. It's actually from Intel. I think you could buy this uh, at retail as a normal customer. All right, and forgive me, I could never memorize what the different uh, patterns look like, but yes, this is literally uh, just mini ITX. So this is a, a normal PC motherboard. You could put this in an ordinary case, but they definitely expected you to use it in some kind of embedded application like this because uh, we've got a couple connectors here that are definitely not normal uh, desktop PC components. Uh, I don't know what those are offhand, but for my money, I'm guessing they're LVDS. Here, let's just check the spec sheet. So the DQ77, as is common for Intel desktop boards, that's the name of the chipset, Q77. Uh, and this was first sold in 2012. Oh, I'm sorry, this is thin mini ITX. I guess what that means, uh, probably, is that the ports are only a uh, single stack. They, they don't have any like big towers of USB ports. And there we go, the graphics output uh, is HDMI DisplayPort and then LVDS and uh, EDP, which are both interfaces used to talk more or less directly to uh, flat panels. Uh, they're used internally in laptops and they're used in a lot of like commercial touch screens and uh, devices with embedded displays of one kind or another. I'm kind of wondering if it's LVDS on one side and EDP on the other. That is in fact exactly what's going on. The one on top is the LVDS port and the one on the bottom is the EDP port. And you know, there, there is a possibility, I have to admit, that this board is working perfectly, it's just only outputting through one of these. Now that doesn't make any sense. Someone would have had to go in and uh, set that in the, the, the BIOS because this machine didn't have any flat panel display built in. So it would have been using one of these ports. I mean, they exposed them out the back of the machine, whereas, uh, as I suspected, there is a second Ethernet port in here, which they had hidden. So if they didn't want you using these, they wouldn't have been usable. So I can't think of a reason that it would be set to output to one of these, and I'm pretty sure I cleared the BIOS, but I guess we should be 100% before I uh, replace this. And if you're curious about these two headers up here, one of them is a debug interface, and the other one is a backlight control for an attached flat panel display. Oh, and more things that are useful for embedded systems. Uh, it has a connector here, which you can use to uh, connect to internal stereo speakers. Uh, so it basically is, is probably bridged over to the headphone jack here. And also this guy over here, which will come into play later, is an alternative DC input uh, that overrides the, uh, the laptop style power jack. And also I was wrong about this guy here. It is a perfectly cromulent mini PCIe slot. It's just too short for the AverMedia card. Uh, it's really quite a bummer. Like they really couldn't have found a board that had two full length mini PCIe's. Like, like really? And just my final comment on this board is what is going on with the SATA connectors over here? They really couldn't get them in a row, I guess. <laughs> They're just sort of cockeye all over the place. Like those dweebs over at Intel don't know how to make a motherboard. <laughs> I'm smart, I know things. All right, anyway, let's um, let's see if this thing will fire up just on the desk here with no CMOS settings. We'll pull the uh, CR2032 and we'll give it one more shot. All right, there's absolutely nothing installed that could be interfering. Let's plug this guy in. Do we feel the proc getting hot? Oh, I'm getting some warmth off the CPU, but I think I was getting that before. Oh yeah, yeah, that's getting getting toasty there. We do have a power light on up here. Uh, we don't know for sure the machine is running, but I would be shocked if it wasn't. Oh, what? Oh my God, it's working. What? Get out of here. Oh, what did I miss before? If anybody watching was not expecting this outcome, you have not been following the series. Of course, of course, of course I missed something. Was it the damn, ba I'll bet it was the damn battery. I'll bet I never pulled the battery. I cleared the CMOS but I'll bet I just did it wrong and it still had a setting in there. Oh man, 
there are worse things. I mean, at least I have another <laughs> functioning motherboard out of the deal. All right, well, let's let's put it back in the computer. This is the acid test. Let's see if it keeps working. And don't worry, I'll be showing you that NCR machine anyway, because um, it's neat in its own right. Neater than this one, honestly. All right, we're restored to its original state. This is exactly how it was when I started the video, and it works, but we knew that. I've been over this thing over and over and over and over again, and I guess I just never tried that. Although for what it's worth, the machine does appear to be hung right now. That's that's interesting and fun. Yeah, this is interesting. It uh, it appears to start up, but then it does absolutely nothing. Maybe it's not working. Let's replace the memory. Oh, that's right. I tried this before. It's PC3 12800, and I just don't have anything that fast laying around. But you know what? You know where we can probably find RAM that'll work in this motherboard? Ugh. How about the donor machine that I bought specifically because it has the exact same motherboard? Okay, so here's a fun tip for you. Just uh, if you're trying to do this sort of stuff, uh, just a, a clever technique you can use. So the motherboard in my media site is a uh, DQ77KB. So we head over to eBay, we drop in the part number. Uh, let's see, um, here's a machine based on it that's $675. Here's one of the boards for $125. Uh, here's one for $250. That might be one, that's $127. You, you get the picture, right? These are all quite expensive. But while I was going through the listings trying to find one with a make and offer, I came across one that's that's gone now apparently, which had a whole list of machines that take this motherboard at the bottom. So if you're searching for replacement motherboard for X, it would come up. So uh, it turns out one of the machines that takes this board is an NCR1657. And if you search for those on eBay, they're $40. Now I would much rather pay 40 than 97 or 150 or 250, so I figured, hey, it gets me a little guy in the process too, so that's free money, baby. So this is it, although you can see uh, right through the bottom that it's clearly not the same kind of system. However, you can see from the ports on the back that it clearly is. And yet you can also see from the ports on the back that it clearly isn't, because what's this? That's not a Dell HP power supply at all. In fact, several things are, are different, but of course, it's, it's probably clear why, if you've been paying close attention. Let's go ahead and get this thing open. It's always such a bummer uh, that the hard drives are always pulled in these things. Uh, of course, I say that, but at the same time, I have gotten devices like this before that actually had the hard drives, and there was absolutely nothing interesting on them. Like the most boring minimalist software in existence because I mean, why wouldn't it be like that, right? I have absolutely no idea what this machine was used for, but NCR does a lot of point of sale and a lot of other just like very boring uh, number crunchy type stuff. So my guess is that whatever it did, I would have had no interest in it. And believe me, I have tried to have interest in stuff like that. It has not worked and I'm me. All right, is it gonna just come right open? Oh, I, oh it's already coming open. <laughs> there we go. Uh, does the back have a separate plate? Nope, it's an L shape, and then we got a panel over here. All right, so there it sits, and if we sit it next to the one from other machine, uh, they're pretty clearly the same board. They've got uh, all the same parts in the same places. So yeah, I definitely got the right thing. Not that I necessarily need it anymore. Well, I guess we'll see, won't we? But of course, there are also <laughs> some differences. So obviously, uh, they've gone with a very different cooling solution here. While the media site just uses a, a fan, it's just a, a PC and a small chassis, this one is fully passively cooled. And boy, howdy, is it ever cooled. This is, I think, the biggest heat sink I have ever seen on anything like this. You know, I neglected to check this, so how thick is that chassis? Because it is tremendous. All right, non-counterfeit Mitotoyos, what do we got? That is uh, 7.6 millimeters or 0.3 inches. I can't remember what that is in fractions. And then over here, I think this is the thickest point. That is 10.25 millimeters, 0.4 inches, nearly half an inch. God, that is a lot of aluminum. I, I don't know if it's apparent, but like this, this is, you know what, here. Maybe that didn't do it for you either, but this thing, this thing is heavy. 
And you know, that's the idea with passively cooled machines, right? You just need an enormous thermal mass uh, to hold the heat and dissipate it. So that's definitely what they've done. And they've really not messed around getting the heat over to the sinks either. <laughs> two gigantic heat pipes. I think that's that's probably more cooling than they need. Or maybe not. Honestly, I have no idea what the specs on this thing are. For all we know, there's an i7 under there. So I am eager to fire this thing up and find out what's going on with it. And that's pretty much all we can do because there's not a whole lot else going on here. Oh, <laughs> there's one thing going on. Small barcode label. <laughs> oh man, that's good. Uh, but you know what? Let's let's pop this off real quick because I just want to check. I don't think there's any interesting circuitry on here, but I just want to be sure. All right, got anything going on? Ah, uh, no, not at all. Oh, okay, it looks like this one was actually put together in 2014, uh, and somebody hand soldered this because I can see some uh, no wash flux just chilling on there. That's the power button. Nothing spicy at all, although the ground lands on this board. That's interesting. I wonder why that is. Because the chassis is attached to the motherboard, so the motherboard's grounded, and what else would you necessarily need to ground? Oh, you know what it probably is? Oh, it probably has something to do with this plug. That plug is a subject with this thing. I'm guessing we'll find that one of those pins in the plug is the ground. Okay, that actually answers some questions I had. So, as you can see, uh, this board does actually have that Dell slash HP style connector on it. They're just not using it. They've instead gone with the auxiliary connector behind it. This just loops around uh, through the power board and goes straight into this plug here. That plug, very conveniently, is a standard uh, four pin ATX power connector. So it was not hard to find something I could uh, modify in order to power this thing up. Although I had assumed until I got a look inside this thing that they had desoldered this plug because I forgot that this was here. So I thought I was going to have to build an adapter cable here. I guess I don't technically need to. But I was wondering, why did they bother doing this? Why not just use that plug? Well, the answer to that is that laptop power supplies frequently, if not always, do not pass through earth ground. So for instance, I believe if we plug in this HP supply here, if we check from earth here uh, to the collar, well, actually that one does pass it through, but I know there's a lot that don't. Any laptop power supply that doesn't have the, uh, the Mickey Mouse style plug, if it's just got the two prong plug, then those definitely don't pass through earth. Um, I assumed that these ones only had the third pin for the hot side of the circuit, but apparently I was just wrong about that. I thought I'd been told that they deliberately don't pass through earth, but either this one's faulty or I was just misinformed. Well, that sure was one of my better demonstrations. I'm smart. So anyway, that gives us two theories for uh, why they did this. Uh, one is that it is possible to plug in a supply here that would not be earthed, and they don't want that. Uh, and two is that this one has a latch on it, right? Uh, the laptop supply, you can just yank right out. So I was just looking at the pinout here to figure out if I can um, wire something up to this real quick. And I noticed that uh, these are both earth, and then their trace goes around there through a resistor on their way to the uh, ground tab here. And I'm like... Why would you want a resistor on, on Earth? I've never heard of that before. Probably a lot of people have already guessed this, but uh, it's exactly what you think. That is not a resistor. The three zeros indicate that that is actually a uh, just a straight through short. It is a zero ohm resistor, and they're used in electronics assembly as a jumper that can be placed by an automated pick and place machine. So um, presumably they would have a version of this, or they might want a version of this that doesn't have uh, the earth connected. And then they could just have the machine not place that particular component. And uh, just to put any doubts to rest, there you go. Uh, 0.2 ohms, which I think is actually the resistance of my leads. Yep. So besides that, let's figure out where positive and negative are. So that's positive. Those are both negative. And you know what? Here's a fun thing about this. It's already wired up correctly. You've got the two positives on the bottom and the two negatives on the top. Yep, the color code here is correct. All I have to do is uh, snip these leads and connect 19 volts so this thing should fire right up. Now, where would we ever find a 19 volt power supply that's already got bare wires on it? You may remember this from episode one. Let's just remember the uh, white wires in pin one, the black wires in pin two. It's labeled on the device anyway. And to marry these together, we'll be using some extremely on-brand connectors that were definitely made by Wago. Wago? However it's pronounced. 
Okay, it looks like white is positive, black is negative. I wonder if I can just push these directly into the, uh, the Wago connector. Will that work? <laughs> They're a bit long, but it actually works. Yeah, there we go. I trimmed a little bit and it fits. Uh, I'm happy with that. Well, that's cleaner than I expected. Polarity checks out. All right, we should be good to go. Let's see if it goes bang. Nope, oh, nope, it's on. Terrific. Okay, naturally they uh, put their own label on there and <laughs> this board tells you to go to a website <laughs> when it doesn't boot. Well, it certainly gets further than the other one. Let's um jump into the BIOS and see what hardware we've received here. I'm guessing i3, maybe i5. Yep, that is an i5-3470T, and hang on a moment. Let's, let's drink this in. Perhaps this is not new to you, but it is to me. Wow. That is such a look. That is such a strong look. Well, at any rate, what do we got going on here? So, uh, yeah, it's an i5-3470T, which I think think is just a normal desktop processor, nothing special about that. Uh, third gen, so with that cooling solution, I think I could easily drop an i7 in there. I might do that. Then we've got eight gigs of memory, Natch. Oh, that's interesting, two gigabit ethernet ports, but different models. One is an 82.579, one is an 82.574. I wonder why that was. I don't think I would be able to, to find that answer. Yeah, and I think this is gonna be a pretty normal desktop style BIOS, so I don't think we're gonna see much Oh, oh my gosh, look, look, a little diagram. Are, are, are we, are you, are you getting this out there in TV land? Is everyone seeing this? The last time I saw this was in a BIOS from a compact made in like 1993. This is absolutely adorable. Will it show me graphically when they're turned off? No, it won't, but at least you can, you can map them that. Yeah, 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 it's good enough. Oh, and I was staring at this going, what? Was this used in a motherboard that had a, a much taller, like a 7.1 audio stack there? No, they just needed that much height to fit in five letters. <laughs> well, that is cute and unexpected. What else do we have here? Okay, here we go. These are all the settings for the flat panel display interfaces. And I was curious if there was anything special in here um, that would basically lock it into an LVDS mode uh, so it wouldn't detect HDMI or anything. And yeah, it does look like it. Like, whoa. Intel customized this for a specific set of all-in-one computers? Well, these are coming up in uh, thin mini ITX component catalogs. Oh, okay. This is direct from Intel. So Intel was really wanting to get hard into all-in-one PCs. The thin mini ITX thing looks like it was their initiative. Oh man, were they just really mad about the iMac? Is that what was going on? Yeah, here we go. They got a whole bunch of specific names. There's the uh, the Loop AIO. We've got the um, one of the Gigabyte ones that they're uh, referring to uh, over there. Uh, we've got the ECS. That's probably the one uh, at the top of the list there. There's the uh, Wibtech A21, another loop, uh, the MyTac. Oh, Shuttle got in on it. Who's surprised there? Unsurprisingly, they all look exactly identical. Like there's no reason you'd buy one over the other, I'll bet. Well, that explains a lot. I was wondering why this thing had a laptop style power connector on it. Uh, well, an, an all-in-one computer is basically a inconvenient laptop. It's a laptop without a working battery. So uh, essentially that's what they've done here. They've designed a laptop motherboard that's just a little bit bigger so it can fit in a, a normal PC. And I love that they call it a uh, mainstream motherboard power connector because they can't just say um, Dell and HP. And then they actually have a list of specific third-party power supplies they tested with this thing. Oh, and naturally we've got to get in on the rest of their uh, vertical integration. Got to get the Intel SSD, got to get the Centrino wireless. I wonder if this initiative just died. I'll bet that it did. This whole idea of having, you know, standardized mini ITX motherboards for AIOs. I'm pretty certain without even checking that this just, this just died. Just never happened after like 2015. You know, they put out a few of these things. It wasn't worth it because companies would rather just have a board fabbed from scratch. They'd rather go to, um, I can never remember, one of the like three companies that designs all the laptops uh, and just have them make a motherboard. Like they can do it in their sleep, right? It, it's probably cheap as free. So that's fascinating. And it explains why there's all these flat panel display options in here. I was wondering, cause it didn't seem like much of an industrial board, but this makes a lot more sense. 
So both uh, Sonic Foundry or whatever they're called and NCR were buying boards that were basically intended for bottom of the barrel, best buy, AIO sludge uh, that you get for your grandma. That's um, that's about right. It's an Intel desktop board. It's probably fine. Oh man, and you can get in here and set up all the like EDID stuff that gets sent to the uh, flat panel display and the inverter frequency and polarity and current. And you know what? When you pick advanced flat panel display settings, it gives you a little warning uh, once you get in here. But then there's yet another level, expert settings. Ooh, look at all that stuff. This is fascinating. I have never seen anything that's, um, you know, nuts and bolts in a PC CMOS setup. That is wild. It looks like you can overclock it. Getting my overclocked all-in-one machine from Walmart for $400. All right, and a lot of the rest of this stuff is uh, pretty ordinary, although this is just one of the most verbose bio setups I've ever seen. They're, they have every single option turned on. Wait, startup sound? BIOS will play the Intel sound mark via onboard audio during each boot. Uh, okay, let's do that. I'm going to ask those of lesser constitution to stand back for their own safety because you could be killed by the volume and fidelity of the Jascos. The finest unpowered speakers Sony won't sell you. It's a show about little things. Of course we need little speakers. It didn't do it. You know, I wonder if it really means the, uh, the little port here where you can attach like internal speakers. Okay, I just went through a whole bunch of misery trying to get uh, jumpered onto the internal audio header here, and then realized that if you just put this up to your ear, you can hear it. This just isn't amplified enough. Here, I'll put it against the mic. All right, well, that was quite a diversion, but uh, we came here to get the Aver Media capture cards working, so let's uh, go back to that. I'm gonna try popping the RAM out of here and see if that heals the other machine. So far, no, it should not be doing this. Oh, look at that. Um, I got an answer off of Reddit. Uh, somebody else having a problem with a DQ77KB, uh, pretty much the same issue, and someone said to go in and move the BIOS jumper to config, uh, which I thought was uh, just the BIOS reset, but no, if you move this over to pins two and three, suddenly it seems to start working, and I checked in uh, this machine and sure enough that is where it is i wonder if that's been the problem all along for the most part yeah this looks like uh, all the same stuff so let's put a damn operating system on here well that feels good oh and before we button this back up there's just one more thing i wanted to comment on this board here it's strange this board has a usb interface here and then on the other side, it's just got these two wires and that's the whole thing. And I think it's obvious what this does once you see it in action, because when you turn this on, we get a blue light and we get pulsing. And certainly the motherboard's not doing that, right? Now give it a moment. Oh, maybe it doesn't feel like doing it today. Well, okay, I'm not sure what causes it, but I've seen this just turn red before. So uh, what I think is that this is a little microcontroller uh, that speaks to the machine over USB. When you power it on, it uh, sees the five volt come up and not knowing anything about the state of the machine, it assumes you just powered the system up and then it's going through the boot process. And then it's gonna sit there and wait to get recognized by a driver running on the operating system. And when it does, it's gonna start talking to the OS and getting you know information about the state of the software and the machine. Presumably this is a mix of sort of a watchdog, right? Where it's gonna turn red if it thinks that the system has fallen over so that a user on site uh, will know that they need to go power cycle it or it might even report things like whether it's currently recording or uploading or whatever clever little thing uh, but i don't know why the board is so complicated like if that's truly all this does then why do we have all these other bits and pieces on here there's a whole bunch of unpopulated resistors and capacitor pads and there's a header here and all kinds of other things so they had other stuff in mind for this Oh, and uh, by the way, it does have a name on the back, Embed Tech LLC, F51A. I looked that up and didn't get anything. The sticker inside tells us this used to run Windows Embedded. That was probably Windows 7 Embedded, which I just learned how to install in the last video I shot. So I'm going to go ahead and get that started. That took way longer than I expected. But uh, here we are, I've got Windows running. I've got the drivers installed for the gadgets. You can see they both show up in... Soba, I'm shooting a video. 
This is why I normally shoot my videos at my studio. I can't get anything done around these animals. You're dusty. You got dust all over you. So about you are not ESD safe. Has everything been adequately inspected? How did you even shut down my computer? Okay, good news. We passed inspection and I got everything cabled up here. So we've got two video sources. Uh, in fact, two other little guys here. One will provide VGA, which we're putting into card one through a VGA DVI adapter. And the other one uh, will just be doing straight DVI. We could also use HDMI through an adapter because the card internally actually refers to that input as HDMI. And there we go, we're capturing from both devices simultaneously, or at least we're uh, previewing them. Curiously, for some reason, I can't get the capture to actually run. Um, this worked the last time I tried it, but uh, if I hit record here, it does a whole bunch of flickering, and then uh, we just get this weird error message. So I don't know what that's all about, but uh, the thing is, this would not have been the software that this system actually used. Uh, I'm sure that uh, the media site product was a bespoke thing because uh, this came with an SDK that had all these APIs for integrating with the cards directly. So this is just Avermedia's demo app for showing what they're capable of. And uh, to wit, I have never actually seen another video recording program that let you capture from multiple sources at once two separate files. Like there is a hack to do it with OBS, which pretty consistently makes OBS crash. And I think there's some way to split off multiple streams from vMix, but you can only do it from one canvas as far as I know. And like, even if it's sort of kind of doable, uh, the point is that it's just incredibly rare and unintended behavior. Nobody, nobody deliberately makes anything that can do this. Uh, but this program will actually take an indefinite number of Avermedia cards and capture each one into a separate file simultaneously. I've seen it work before. I don't know why it's not working now. But that said, it's still just uh, a janky piece of software. It's supposed to demonstrate the cards themselves. Like I said, I don't have uh, the actual software that would have come with this thing. So this is as far as I can go. But ultimately, this is all this box did. It did this, and then it put some mustard on the results. And uh, just to put a point on it, uh, these are completely ordinary capture cards. So if we open up OBS Studio here, I can just drop in two video sources and set them to the individual cards, and there they are. Uh, they seem to be capturing at about 30 FPS from the looks of it, and that sounds about right for the era. It wasn't hard to get capture cards that could do 30 FPS back then. It was really hard, however, to get cards that could do 60, uh, especially at high frame rates. I think if you were down in like the 720p range or lower, it wasn't that hard, but if you wanted to do 1080 in particular, I'm sorry, you were getting 30 or you were getting interlaced, but that was it up until like nearly the end of the 2010s, in my experience. There's probably exceptions to this, but uh, as far as I know, at the consumer price point, you were pretty much looking at 30 FPS at any sort of normal computer resolution. And for what it's worth, these do a good job. I don't know how much they cost, but the captured image looks uh, pretty damn good. And with that, we're pretty much done for the day. I don't know what else I can show you with this thing. Uh, that's pretty much what I was trying to do. I just wanted to get it, you know, running with its original hardware. I don't know that I necessarily have a use uh, for this capture setup, especially at 30 FPS, but, you know, I had it. I just wanted to see it working as intended, and I wanted to figure out what was going on with that motherboard, and I guess I did. I feel pretty silly about not having figured out what was wrong with the motherboard before, uh, but I suppose it's not a bad thing that I now have one of these. Uh, <laughs> this thing is entertaining, if nothing else, and I can use it as a doorstop. Plus, I think this one would suffer an i7 a lot uh, better than that one would. So if I do want to build myself some sort of, um, you know, dedicated box that does some decently high power processing, then uh, this, this might actually be useful for that. And maybe I can come up with something intrinsically interesting I can do with it. Like, I have not plumbed the depths of what is possible in the mini PCIe form factor, and this does have an X4 slot in it as well. So it's got a decent amount of bus interconnects, so you could throw some serious hardware into this thing conceivably. So I'm trying to think if there's any sort of, like, um, little stunts I could do with this machine. I mean, it's got dual drive bays, too, so you could put quite a bit of storage in it. It seems almost like it could be useful. Or maybe it's just going to take up space forever. Uh, what else is new? Big mood, personally.
Anyway, that's pretty much it for the video. I hope it wasn't too plodding. I mean, it didn't go at all the way I expected it to, so I just had to try and keep up with events, but uh, hopefully the result was entertaining. If so, then uh, maybe subscribe to my channel so I know you're into this sort of thing and you can see future episodes because I'll be doing a lot more of these, uh, hopefully a little more cohesive than this one. Uh, but if you really want to help me out, then consider supporting me on Patreon like these people here are doing. Uh, this sort of stuff, I just have to kind of pick up on eBay, um, hoping that it turns out to be something interesting. I've got like three or four of these things in flight right now that, I don't know, they might turn out to be nothing. Who knows? And the only reason I have a budget to do that sort of thing is because of support from viewers like you. Uh, they're also paying for my groceries and gas in my car and rent and the whole nine yards. So, you know, I appreciate that also. <laughs> I'm incredibly grateful to everyone who's supported me on there. Uh, thank you all so much. And everyone else, thanks for watching.